This episode of Midco Sports Magazine is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Hello, welcome again to Midco Sports Magazine. We have three stories this month to take you behind the scenes. We will take you to Minnesota, where the front office for the state's NFL team is filled with employees who made the move from South Dakota. We have a South Dakota student with autism who just happens to be great with numbers, using his abilities as a super statistician for the high school football team. But we start in Colorado. Billups is a basketball name. Chauncey Billups played 17 seasons in the NBA. His little brother Rodney is now trying to make a name for himself in his second season as a Summit League head coach at the University of Denver. Here's David Brown. There's always a sense of comfort at home. The familiarity, the routine, and the idea you can always come back no matter where you go. Denver, Colorado is where Rodney Billups and his brother Chauncey grew up but the basketball court was their true home. I was always going to the gym at a, at a young age and Chauncey being six years older than me, I just, you know, I, I kind of wanted to follow his footsteps in every facet of basketball and being a community ambassador and wanting to stay and, and represent our, our city and our, our, our state. Chauncey became the first Billups family ambassador in the mid 90s, starring at the University of Colorado before being selected third overall in the 1997 NBA draft. At the same time, Rodney was just beginning his basketball odyssey, trying to navigate his way between following his brother's footsteps and establishing his own identity. You know, my freshman and sophomore year, it was, it was tough as far as the pressure. Everyone expected me to be you know, just as good as him, and I expected that, so I put a lot of added pressure on them myself. Growing up was tough for him, you know, obviously being my younger brother um, in Denver, you know, and he was a really, really good player, player that uh, they didn't appreciate his, his game enough because they expected him to be like me. Rodney didn't receive a scholarship out of high school, and after just one year at a junior college in California, he did everything he could to come back to the one place he knew he could thrive. I got homesick very quick. And, you know, in fact, through my recruitment to come back to Denver, I was the one who initiated the contact. I came back and I, I played with the guys in front of the staff, uh, and they then offered me a scholarship. So I was the one who pushed the envelope to come back home, and, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship. Despite the return home, a three-year playing career at the University of Denver didn't translate to the NBA. Rodney was able to make some money playing two years in Europe. But when his mother got sick, he returned to the United States and put basketball on the back burner. I went and uh, started two businesses. Uh, one, me and Chauncey joined and, and started an investments company, which was good. But it just, you know, over those two years, I always was around basketball and I always wanted to stay connected. He tried his hand in a couple of little different things and, and he, he said, you know what, I got a lot of equity in this game in basketball. I know a lot, I've seen a lot, and uh, I want to give, give that knowledge down. Sitting in front of a, a computer screen trying to find some ways to make some money or make some money work for us, it just, it was, it was, it was fun at first. It was interesting traveling around the country and, and meeting new people. But, you know, at the, at the end of the night, of every night, I was watching basketball. Coaching became a natural starting point, and Rodney started at the bottom of the coaching rung in 2010 as director of basketball operations at the University of Colorado. The grunt work was, you know, dealing with compliance, dealing with academics, scheduling travel, scheduling games. It was not hard, but it was just every day you had to stay on it, you had to be fresh, your ideas had to be fresh. After two seasons in basketball operations, Rodney moved to the bench as an assistant coach for Colorado. He loved being courtside, soaking in the atmosphere and connecting with kids in his home state. He had no plans of leaving until his alma mater came calling. The University of Denver made Rodney its head coach in March of 2016, at the ripe old age of 33. For what matters, it's, per it's a perfect age. I can get out on the floor and demonstrate drills. Uh, I still have a competitive edge to be able to compete with the guys if need be. 
So it's, it's, it's fun in the sense of I got this job at the right age. He was ready when it was time for him to take over. And I'm so proud of the job he's been able to do. He's just a great guy to be around. I just love being around him because he's, he's closer to us in age. Um, so we can kind of just hang out with him, sort of like go in his office and just talk to him about anything. It doesn't have to be basketball. From the outside looking in, it seems like everything has fallen perfectly into place for Rodney Billups. But the journey down this path is just beginning. Rodney knows full well homecomings don't always have fairy tale endings. It's not full circle yet. I think I got to win some games first and, and develop some, some student athletes and make guys into the players that they wish they could be. Uh, then I think it'll be full circle, but for now it's, it, it's closing, but it's not there yet. Open-ended or not, Rodney Billups has found his way home. The time it takes to close that circle will be up to him. But the zigzag pattern he took to get to this point is what makes the shape of his journey so unique. And the one man everyone compared him to, the one man everyone tried to make him become, the one man who knew just how hard it was to have the last name Billups in the city of Denver, now knows the opposite. The lane that he's in now, coaching, is something that I've never done. Um, and I'm glad that he's blazing his own trail. Um, and when you say the Billups name, it's not just Chauncey anymore, it's Chauncey and Rodney, um, because he's doing his own thing, and I'm proud of him for that. And joined now by David Brown, and I love this story. And Chauncey Billups is retired from yep. the NBA, but he's not that far away in case little brother Rodney wants a little advice, right? Yeah, Chauncey's primary job right now, obviously, he's an analyst for ESPN, but he lives in Denver. He lives five minutes from the University of Denver campus, and so when his schedule allows, Rodney will invite him in, and Chauncey will freely work out with the kids. But when Chauncey was talking to me, he freely admitted Rodney doesn't need his help. He says Rodney knows the ins and outs of the coaching profession better than Chauncey ever will. So Chauncey may have been the better player, but he freely admits Rodney's a much better coach. Rodney, an up-and-comer in the summer league. All right, thanks a lot. David Brown. Midco Sports Magazine on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back to Midco Sports Magazine. From the executives to player personnel, sales and marketing, more than 230 people work in the front office for the Minnesota Vikings. And a surprising number of them, somebody you might even know, are from South Dakota. Here's Kelly Stewart. Dakota and Minnesota, two states that border each other and share a lot of the same good old Midwestern qualities. Oh but there is one particular area where Minnesota has the edge, and that's the professional sports scene. Take a trip to Minneapolis and you have your pick. The Timberwolves, the Lynx, the Wild, the Twins, the Vikings, just to name a few. But when it comes to football, it's no secret that South Dakota is Vikings territory. Seems like it's 90% Viking fans, maybe 10% Packer fans, but growing up I, did, I didn't hardly know any Packer fans. It was 100%, that was our home team. I'd always been a Vikings fan. I grew up watching the Vikings, grew up going to, I went games at Met Stadium, games at Metrodome. I think that we do a good job of, of kind of maybe outreaching across Minnesota state lines and getting into the Dakotas and Iowa. And even stretching to the Black Hills that Minnesota nice has had an effect on people. From day one, as soon as I started to get to know everybody in the building, all the players, the organization, uh, that makes the decision really easy on who you're cheering for. There's a bunch of great people, a lot of good guys, so it it's, makes it easy to cheer for them, for sure. South Dakotans know the players from their state that have donned the purple and gold. It's people like Chad Greenway, Ben Lieber, and Riley Reef. Another tidbit, the very first Vikings game was played at Howard Wood Field in Sioux Falls. Welcome. Welcome to your new home. One of the reasons the falls themselves were featured in Minnesota's welcome home video with the opening of U.S. Bank Stadium. We are St. Paul and Sioux Falls. But step off the field and in to the front office. And the South Dakota connection to the Vikes is much greater behind the scenes, administrative, secretarial, coordinating, anything that Coach Zimmer needs, I can save time for him to do more on the field. Try to get the players and coaches in position to succeed on game day, from moving around on airplanes to equipment trucks and buses and food. Working on practice squad players uh, from other teams, working on 
the advance of our upcoming opponent. I hand all of the players, coaches, executives, dealings with the media and the public. I'm in charge of all the people that produce the content for the website, for the TV shows, for social media. And even spearheading the construction of the new Viking Stadium. It was a rewarding process, challenging process, but we think at the end of the day it just turned out uh, really phenomenal. So some pretty important roles, you could say. And although nobody's journey to the front office is the same, just about all of them share a similar piece, that being a tie to the Rushmore State. When I got into training camp, it was just a training camp internship and working for Luther and Chad Lindeen and Paul Martin, and we just kind of hit it off, you know, and I think part of that is kind of the South Dakota ties with Luther a little bit. You know, we knew a lot of the same people. I had done some work with the Hunt family that owned the, the Kansas City Chiefs and uh, through one of my mentors, John Wagner, who worked for the Hunts, and John Wagner is a Clark, South Dakota guy. Uh, one of the guys that he worked with actually became the Vikings EVP and general manager in 98, 99. And when he was gonna hire this position, uh, I hadn't spoken to him in two years and he called me out of the blue and, and asked me to come interview for the job. Okay, so think about South Dakota. It's a beautiful state, no doubt, but it's smaller in population. There are a lot of farmers and ranchers. The entire state has a quaint, small-town feel to it. Yet trek a few hours to Minneapolis, one of the largest and most populous cities in the U.S., and there are a bunch of SD natives working in an NFL front office. I think there's a common thread with everyone from South Dakota or who has South Dakota ties here. I think of being hard workers. Pretty much all of us have family that were ranchers, farmers growing up, so you get that instilled in you at an early age. There is something to that, that you know, any of us that grew up there, that's kind of what you knew. You grew up and you worked hard. For these South Dakotans, it's more than a job. It's representing their state on one of the highest levels with core values. Values that Rushmore State residents prided themselves in long before Minnesota even had a professional football team. My dad was a huge Vikings fan, and so I think growing up was probably, he'd be very proud knowing that I was working here just because he was such an avid fan as well. We've just continually gotten great people from our state. The people that we have here from South Dakota just represent uh, where they come from. Um, so well that when we start talking to people and they happen to be from South Dakota, you kind of get over that initial barrier right away and just like, hey, let's really dig in and see if this is a fit. And joined by Kelly Stewart. All right, Stu, you get over there and not surprisingly, you see some South Dakota hospitality right away. Yeah, I mean, I roll up in the Midco terrain and Sam Newton met me at Winter Park and immediately he got a bunch of people to help unload my equipment, walk it down onto the turf. And I was like, you guys, I got this. Like, this is not your job. And they're like, no, you know, we'll help you out. And it was just nice from the start. So a combination of South Dakota hospitality and Minnesota nice, maybe. All right. And Sam is one of the people that you actually have a, a personal connection to in this story. Right? Yeah, just talking between interviews, Sam is from Spearfish yeah. and my former coach, Amy Williams, her parents from Spearfish and Sam had them as teachers, Tim and Kathy. And then also Reed Burkhart, one of the Pro Scouts, played football with Hank McCall, who we know at SDSU. And Mary Rudman, her niece, Amy Miller, is a trainer in Sioux Falls. I worked out at her gym. And Steve Poppin went to school with Bobby He Miller, who is Ty He Miller's dad, who I played basketball with and is one of my good friends. So all sorts of connections. Played high school basketball against Steve Poppin. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Fun stuff. All right. Thanks a lot. Kelly Stewart. Coming up, the analytics kid, a special student with a mind made for crunching numbers and coaching football. But first, the science of sports, strength, speed, and agility with Augustana University alum and current Minnesota Viking, C.J. Hamm. Sports science is really understanding the, the physiology and the biomechanics behind athletic performance and, and health and safety. With CJ, we're looking at his acceleration. As a, as a running back in the NFL, you have to get up to speed very quickly and produce a lot of force when you hit the line.
Coaches can use that information to determine where an athlete's going to be best fit on a, on the playing field so that they know if they've got a strong, powerful athlete, what type of position would be best suited for an athlete with those attributes. Midco Sports Magazine on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back. Our next story is about a student with autism. He's got a knack for numbers and an interest in football, and that combination made him a very important part of his high school team this past season. Here's Jason Andera. A high school football team consists of kids with a variety of different physical skill sets. Those that are fast, those that are strong, and those that have a certain knack for the ball. But what TF Riggs High School in Pierre, South Dakota has on its football team is a mental advantage. Head coach Steve Steele has been using analytics throughout his six-year coaching career to call plays from the sidelines. He's coached at Dakota State University in Madison, South Dakota, as well as TF Riggs. He is even a published author for the American Football Coaches Association on the topic. You're using data, statistical data, to say, okay, statistically this play should be the one that we should call in this situation, so that way we can just say second and two, this is the yard line, boom, there's our play. Uh, you know, and I said we had a lot of success with that in my last year at Dakota State as well. In college, Coach Steele had the help of assistants in crafting an analytical game plan. But when he switched jobs... You know, my first year here at the high school level, it was kind of just me. Many coaches might scour the halls looking for stars who can catch the ball at crunch time. Coach Steele found his star sitting quietly in biology class, who is an expert at crunching numbers. He's a guy where you never in a million years would have dreamed he'd have been a part of the football team and he was not just a part, he was a huge major part. Uh, it's something I hadn't really done before with my math skills. I was on show and a little nervous. But it ended up being funny when I got to correct all of Steele's mistakes over and over again. I'm like, well, if he's finding mistakes and all this stuff that no one else was finding, you know, he's definitely the guy for the job. J.C. Byer continued to interpret data to help coach Steele and the peer football team with play calling. J.C. grew up loving to go to peer sporting events. I can kind of still remember going to games when I was in grade school and being bothered by noises. He enjoyed sports and wanted to go to them, but we would take him to sporting events and he'd have meltdowns. Everybody has something going on in their lives, but J.C.'s is autism. Like many kids with autism, J.C. sometimes struggles with communication and social norms. His senses are extremely acute, but he's still able to share several gifts with the world. For him, he is actually considered a massive aunt, so that's where his math comes from. But I think his forte is uh, his mathematical skills. He's very skilled in calculus, and I think uh, Coach Steele saw that. So what exactly does J.C. do? already from the stats that, that I've done to see which plays they've had the most success with so they can learn which ones they need to, to figure out how to counter. He was able to do more than I could have ever imagined, you know, I mean, typically a, one breakdown would take me about an hour for a game and he could do it in about 10 to 15 minutes. Coach Steele has a gift for putting people in the right positions on the field, but it was JC who helped put the players in the right position to get some wins. In 2016, they were under 500. In 2017, they marched all the way to the number one seed in the playoffs. Our team really made that our goal was to get to the Dome so that he could come with us and, you know, experience a trip with the guys. Pierre reached the 11 AA title game against Harrisburg. But the game didn't get off on the right foot for the Governors. Usually I don't get too fed up with the results of football games, but considering that this was the grand finals and see if we could uh, make this work, I got a lot worried, scared, and disappointed. A lot more so than usual. It's a point where Mom had to keep reminding me that it was just the beginning and there's plenty of time to make a comeback. And I said, you know what, son? Win or lose, we are at the Dome. Think about the success that this team has had this year. Despite an early double-digit deficit, Pierre ended up winning the state championship with a fourth-quarter comeback. After sealing the victory with a late turnover, the Governors galloped across the Dakota Dome turf, and Coach Steele made sure J.C. was a part of the celebration. I, I didn't expect J.C. to storm the field with everybody else. 
Uh, but you know, I said seeing him run out there and uh, seeing his energy, you know, and I said seeing the big smile on his face, that's something you can never ever forget. A special moment for the team and for JC. This has been huge for, for our family, actually. Coach Steele will always have a special place in our heart for seeing something in JC. You know, it's challenging to be a, have a child who's got special needs. And when you can find those things that are going to make them successful, that's huge. Football will always be a team game. From the players to the coaches and everyone in between, Pierre won the 2017 state title with a special collection of individuals. But it was one particular kid who proved you don't need to be on the field to make a difference. You should probably be proud of your, of your ability and find ways to use the things you're good at to great effect and don't focus on things that you can't uh, uh, struggle to do. I've got no doubt he's just going to continue to do amazing things. Uh, you know, so hopefully we're, just, we're hoping we can lock him down to another contract for next year and that he doesn't go pro on us. All right, JC really enjoyed being part of this championship team that night at the Dakota Dome. But he had even more fun a couple days after that, is that right? That was super overwhelming for him. When he got home at the Welcome Home event, though, he said that was his favorite part of the entire season. You know, his name got announced by the coach. He got some special recognition. He was pumping his fists up and down. And, you know, that's really good for him. He's a guy that's really been trying to push this comfort zones. And this really pushed his comfort zone. But in the end, he said that was his favorite part. All right, great story. Thanks a lot, Jason and Derek. Thanks for watching. Check out Midco Sports Magazine on YouTube. This has been Midco Sports Magazine, presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine.